Um, hello everybody. In the last video we were looking at the workings of fiscal policy. So hopefully what you were able to grasp was what expansionary or inflationary fiscal policy was and what contractionary or deflationary fiscal policy was. You should also be comfortable with um, budget deficits, budget surpluses, the limitations of fiscal policy, but also how governments borrow through what we call bond markets. And hopefully what you're able to pick up on was that when there's a growth in demand for bonds, it would lead to a high price of bonds and that would reduce the yield on them bonds because the higher price would mean that people got to pay more to get the fixed um, interest payments on that bond. If you've got a growth in the supply of bonds, it would push down bond prices which means you've got to pay less to buy the bonds, which means that you're getting, in effect, a higher interest rate on those bonds that you're buying. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at another demand side policy, which is monetary policy. So how monetary policy can be used to influence aggregate demand in the economy. So what I would like you to do, first of all, please, is to jot down um, question four. One, two and three were on the fiscal policy video. This is the first one on the monetary policy video. So please jot down your answers for these questions and once you've sorted, um, hit play again and we'll carry on with the rest of the video. Right, okay, now before we start looking at the logistics of monetary policy, you've got here a few different key words which you need to be familiar with. Now, monetary policy um, is mainly using interest rates and quantitative easing, which is the supply of money in the country. But it's also worth noting as well that another tool of monetary policy is the exchange rate. So when we think about monetary policy, we're thinking about the use of interest rates, money supply and exchange rates to influence macroeconomic performance. OK, now every economy across the world will have what we call a central bank. And this is the, um, the organisation responsible for implementing the country's monetary policy. Uh, what they also do, they issue currency and they provide banking services to the government and commercial banks. OK, so you tend to find that um, banks across the country will use the Bank of England, uh, the central bank in, in general, to um, deposit savings. They might borrow money from the central bank and they use it as a benchmark for what interest rate they should charge when they borrow, but also when they take on board people's savings. Now, I've already mentioned it, but the Bank of England is the UK's central bank. So the Bank of England in the UK are responsible for implementing our monetary policy. It's worth noting the Bank of England have got an inflation target handed to them by the government, which is 2%. So price stability um, is where we achieve 2% inflation. It's the job of the Bank of England to keep inflation broadly in line with that 2% target. We do allow a little bit of leeway, so we allow 1% to 3% inflation, but price stability would occur ideally when inflation is at 2%. Now, we, we have a committee within the Bank of England called the Monetary Policy Committee, the MPC, and it's these guys' job to determine the UK's base interest rate, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment or two. So this committee of people will um, be based across the country and they will gather lots of data <coughs> on how the economy is performing, how businesses are performing in their regions, how households are getting on. And they will meet monthly to decide on what they think the interest rate should be. Now, if inflation was forecast or looking like it was going to be too high, they may look to raise the base interest rate. If they think inflation is looking a little bit low, so it's below 2%, they may look to reduce interest rates. Right, OK, now the base interest rate then, let's think about what an interest rate is first of all. A general interest rate is the percentage returns for savers. So if you've got money in the bank, the interest rate is the, is the um, profits you generate on your savings on an annual basis. But it's also the percentage cost of borrowing. So if you take out a loan from a bank, um, well, ultimately, you've got to pay an interest on it. It could be on a mortgage, a credit card, an overdraft, etc. Now, the idea would be that the base rate, interest rate, is the interest rate that is offered to commercial banks that want to borrow from the Bank of England. OK, and then the idea would be that the commercial banks, so your high street banks that you all use, 
will determine their interest rates generally based off the base interest rate. So if base interest rates were to grow, then it would mean that banks would raise their interest rates. So they're, they're offer people higher rates of returns on savings, but they'd also expect a higher rate of return on borrowing. If base interest rates fall, then ultimately it would mean that savers get a low percentage return on savings and people pay a higher percent to borrow money. Right now, the final key term is something we call quantitative easing, which is about the money supply. Now, if the government wants to expand the supply, well, sorry, I beg your pardon, if the Bank of England wants to increase the supply of money in society to maybe stimulate growth in the country, then what they do, they do it through quantitative easing or QE. So what the bank will do, they will create digital money and then they will buy this to buy lots of government bonds or big business bonds from across the country. And these are obviously called what we call financial assets. So if they buy lots of government debt, then it means that the Bank of England control lots of debts um, that used to be held by big financial institutions. Now, the idea would be if the Bank of England were to buy lots of government bonds from big financial institutions like banks or insurance companies, it means there's more money available within banks to lend out to normal households and businesses. So if the Bank of England buy lots of government bonds, it's pushing more money back in for households and firms to borrow to stimulate more growth in the country. Um, another way of thinking about this, though, is that idea of the yield on and the price of bonds. So if you buy a £1,000 bond that yields £50 per, per year, that's ultimately a 5% interest rate. Now, if the government starts selling more bonds to the Bank of England, it means the Bank of England are raising the demand for bonds across the country. What that will do, it will push up the bond price, which means people have got to pay more to access those interest rates on the bonds. So a good example could be a £1,000 bond that gives um, £50 per year it used to give 5% interest per year. If that bond price is now £2,000, it still only generates £50 per year, which means the interest rate on that bond is now down to 2.5%. So it's yielding lower returns to lend to the government. Now, what that will therefore, it means that financial institutions are less keen to lend to the government or buy government bonds, and that will push more money back into the financial system for you and me to borrow. But it also means if interest rates are lowering government bonds, then interest rates across society will fall, which will help stimulate some growth in aggregate demand. But now you can see in these diagrams here, um, the impacts of expansionary or inflationary or what we call loose monetary policy, but also the impacts of tighter or contractionary or deflationary monetary policy. So if you look at the first diagram, then first of all, we would use expansionary monetary policy when we're in a negative output gap. The idea would be if we were to lower base interest rates and use quantitative easing, it will push down interest rates. And that means that money um, is now cheaper to borrow for households and firms, and that would push up consumption and investment. <coughs> what it would also mean is that um, people that have got mortgages, if they've got what we call a variable rate mortgage, then their monthly repayments will go down. And what this will do, it would um, lower uh, mortgage costs and stimulate more growth in aggregate demand. This should hopefully as well boost the demand for mortgages because they're now cheaper to take on board, which might push up house prices and therefore push up wealth and therefore animal spirits across the economy. What lower interest rates will also do though, is they would lower returns on savings. So the idea would be if you're generating low returns on savings, you're more likely to spend them, which again would stimulate aggregate demand. You can see in the diagram, AD moves outwards. We're closing off the negative output gap and that will create some demand pull inflation. So if inflation was 1% and it pushes back up to 2%, then expansionary fiscal policy has done its job. Now, contractionary monetary policy would be used in a positive output gap when inflation is too high. So what we would do now, we would raise the base rate of interest and that would mean that savers are more inclined to save due to the higher returns available on savings and borrowers are less likely to take on board loans due to the higher borrowing costs. And this would have the effect of reducing consumption and investment in favour of savings. It would also mean that people that have got variable rate mortgages will find their mortgage repayments start to increase and that will reduce their ability to spend.
Now, what we could do is, well, we could also reverse quantitative easing. So what the government could now do, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, what the Bank of England could now do is to resell all those bonds they'd bought in quantitative easing. If they release a huge supply of bonds onto the open market, it will push down the bond price, but people still get that fixed um, amount of money interest per year. So you've got to pay less to get those returns. And that will mean that as price of bonds fall, the yield or the interest rates on them bonds will start to grow. So lending to the government becomes more popular again, and that makes it more difficult for households and firms to borrow. OK, so you've got their expansionary and contractionary monetary policy. Right, everyone, now just, a, just a couple of pause questions. What I'd now like you to do, please, is to think about these three questions. So what is a central bank? What is the role of the monetary policy committee? And what is quantitative easing? You might also be thinking about um, expansionary and contractionary monetary policy, the differences between the two of them. So again, hit pause, put down your answers, and when you're ready, if you can then hit play, please. Right, um, you've got here the, some of the limitations of monetary policy, so some of the problems of it in effect, why, you know, it's not always going to lead to the outcome that we want to happen. Now, we have something we call a liquidity trap. Now, the idea is here that when we lower interest rates, we're doing it to try and stimulate more borrowing, more spending to take place, to stimulate a growth in aggregate demand. But the problem is if banks lack confidence, they're worried about people not being able to repay that money or people um, that they might be concerned about people buying property and house prices falling, which leaves the banks exposed to lots of debt. Then banks might not want to pass on those interest rate savings onto consumers. So even though the base rate might be lower, which means big banks can borrow from the Bank of England at lower interest rates, it doesn't mean that banks want to take on that risk. They might not pass on that saving onto consumers. OK, so it still means that we've got a cross society system where people cannot access good borrowing. Right now, another problem. Um, it's difficult to control using interest rates and money supply um, macroeconomic performance. And that is because we have um, lots of different influences on inflation across society. So a good example, everyone, is um, when the economy is in a negative output gap and inflation's fallen, you might want to stimulate AD by lowering interest rates. But to flip that as well, um, in times of boom, you might want to raise interest rates to bring down aggregate demand. Well, the problem is there were lots of influences on inflation rates. So a good example, in 2009, inflation was quite high, despite the fact we were in recession. Now, the, the reason why was we had lots of cost push inflationary pressures taking place across the world. And we had growing food prices and fuel prices. So it was external to the UK economy. Now, it was very difficult for the Bank of England to bring down that rate of inflation. So it's, it's always quite difficult to control inflation or price stability just by relying on interest rates. Now, what makes it even worse is interest rates can also affect the currency value. So if you were to, say, for example, raise interest rates, then that would mean that more people want to invest in your economy to generate higher rates of return. And that would lead to a higher demand for your currency, and that would lead to the currency getting stronger, and that would kill export demand across the economy. So what that has done then, it's affected your trade performance. You tend to find that when you um, bring down interest rates, it lowers the demand for your currency, and that would mean that um, importing becomes more expensive, and that can create lots of inflation. Um, now, on top of that as well, um, interest rates will affect some people and some parts of the economy in very, very different ways. So, for example, when interest rates grow, then it means that people with lots of savings are happy because they're going to get higher rates of returns on savings, which means they've got more funds or more profits from savings that can live off. They've got, in effect, a higher disposable income. But the problem then, though, is that higher interest rates are bad for homeowners. It could mean that mortgages become less affordable. Um, or loans might become less affordable to access. So you tend to find that when interest rates go up, savers are happy, but those that have got lots of borrowing are not very happy about it. Now, clearly, if you were to lower interest rates, it's good for borrowers, but it's not very good for savers. So it's difficult to have a policy which keeps everybody happy when it comes to interest rates. Um, another problem is time lags. So when the Bank of England changes interest rates, uh, the base rate, 
the impact they're trying to have through that interest rate change might not be felt by the economy for 18 months. So it means that when they when the Monetary Policy Committee meets monthly to decide interest rates, they're often looking into the future to try and anticipate what future inflation can be so they can put a policy in place now to have the desired impact in a year or so. Well, again, it's very difficult to predict the future due to all the uncertainty in the economy. So, for example, um, 10 months ago, who could have possibly forecast the impacts of COVID-19? And to give you an example, how um, a lot of people have fixed rate mortgages, which means when the base rate changes, their mortgage repayments don't change. So me, for example, I'm in a current five year fixed mortgage deal and I've got another two years to go on my mortgage. So if interest rates were to fall, that will not benefit me in terms of low repayments until the end of my mortgage term. So when it comes to remortgaging a couple of years or so, that's when I would feel the benefits of that. So that's created a time lag. So, for example, if interest rates fall, it could mean that my repayments might be £50 cheaper per month. But I'm not going to get that benefit until the end of my current mortgage deal. Right. Um, what I'd now like to do is just think about this question. So write down the question, hit pause. And when you're happy, please hit play again, please. Right now, just to bring together um, the end of these videos on demand side policies, I want to think about the Great Depression of the 1930s that started in 1929 and the financial crash of 2008. We're going to consider very briefly what caused it to happen, but then to think about some of the policy responses through fiscal and monetary policy. Right now, the Great Depression, um, well, this started in 1929 by the Wall Street crash in America. Now, what caused it was a sudden sharp drop in share prices. OK, so the idea was in the build up to 1929, there was built what we call a speculative bubble where share prices shot up way beyond the true value of the businesses. And that meant that lots of people were getting very, very wealthy on the back of shares across the American economy. But the problem was eventually people started to realise and wake up to the idea that these shares were all overvalued. And this led to poor animal spirits and people selling shares. Now, what made this a big problem was it meant those that owned the shares, they lost all of their wealth. And what made it even worse was that lots of the people that bought shares didn't even know they bought shares in the first place. Because what happened was people had their money in the banks and the banks were investing everyone's savings into the stock market to make lots and lots of profit. So that meant that the wealth of millions of households across America was wiped out and that led to a massive drop in aggregate demand. Uh, so banks left, right and centre literally collapsed because of the amount of borrowing that built up and that therefore meant it was impossible for people to access liquidity or money. So borrowing was literally dried up across the American economy and that problem sped across the global economy as well. Now, at the same time as well, um, in America, they were using something called protectionism. So this was something drawn up by the smoot Hawley tariffs. So in America, what they did was they tried to protect domestic industries by preventing imports coming in to promote domestic firms. And that dried up international trade between different economies. And that also affected trade performance, which led to a massive growth in unemployment and poverty. Now, um, what you're hopefully thinking is, well, in a recession, when you've got this big drop in aggregate demand and GDP is falling, we've got a big growth in poverty. We should be looking to use expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. Now, the problem was at the moment, at this moment in time, uh, most people that ran economies were classical economists and they therefore believed in the values of the free market economy. So the idea was that supply and demand would automatically adjust to fix this big negative output gap. So governments didn't really intervene through lots of government spending to support economic growth. The idea was the economy has failed. It will learn from its mistakes, but then markets will correct itself to make sure that in the long run, all resources are um, used again in the country. Now, what made it worse, though, was in the UK in particular, we were in this big recession caused by the Great Depression and governments actually did the opposite of what you would expect them to do. Rather than spend, they actually reduced spending and rather than lower taxes, they raised taxes. 
And the idea was that the government believed in the idea of sound government finances. So in other words, not build up national debts. So what happened was because unemployment was creeping up in Britain, the government raised taxes on those that were in work to make sure that government finances remained balanced. Well, what that big growth in taxes did was it made the depression actually worse and it dragged it out for the most of the 1930s. Things only really start to improve um, when World War II starts because it required the government to spend more money. And this is where John Maynard Keynes became very, very popular because he once coined this famous phrase, in the long run, we are all dead. <coughs> the idea was that a classical economist would argue that we don't need expansionary policies because in the long run, the economy would fix itself. So markets would again get to equilibriums by adjusting supply and demand. Keynes said, well, it's a decade, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. We, we, we could tackle these big drops in aggregate demand really, really quickly through lots and lots of expansionary fiscal policy. In fact, in America in 1933, um, they did bring in something called the New Deal, which did promise lots and lots of government spending. Um, it, it wasn't on the scale of what we would expect today, but it was an indication that maybe Keynes was right. And when we're in a recession, governments need to spend more money to get the economy moving back in the right direction again. Right now, the financial crash of 2008 was, was probably the biggest recession or dropping global GDP since the Great Wall Street crash of 1929. Now, in this recession, uh, we had what we call a global credit crunch. The idea was in the start of the 21st century, again, we had a speculative bubble. It wasn't linked to stock markets, but it was now linked to the housing market. And the idea was that we had lots and lots of people, um, big financial firms across the world, investing into the mortgage market. And they were speculating that house prices would keep on growing. And think about why that's so important. If you lend someone £100,000 to buy a £100,000 house, if house prices grow, you have the collateral of the property. So if people don't pay their mortgage, then ultimately you take the house back off them and it's fine. The logic also is, though, that people, if they get in financial problems, they will always repay their mortgage. With the logic being people need to keep a roof over their heads. It's the first thing they will always pay. So the idea was um, we were called irrational exuberance. Lots of people were investing into the mortgage market because they believed that um, it was a really, really safe investment to make. Right now, anyway, then, so think about what's happening. You've got all these big financial firms chucking lots of cheap credit at home buyers. And that led to a massive growth in the demand for property due to better access to mortgages. And that pushed up house prices, making them less affordable. So to keep on that bubble, um, banks relaxed lending criteria. They allowed people to borrow way beyond you know, what their incomes actually were to afford more and more expensive houses. Um, and then what starts to happen was that the big banks start to invest in something called the subprime mortgage market. Now these are people that have got um, dodgy credit histories, people who maybe don't have guaranteed incomes. You know, it was people that are more risky to not repay their mortgages. <clears throat> now the problem was the big banks would often bundle up all of these mortgages into what we call a security. And then they would sell these big bundles of mortgages off to investment banks across the world. So you had these big investment banks buying, you know, literally thousands of mortgages at any one time. And what made it really difficult was for these big investment banks, they were told by the credit agencies they've got triple A ratings. In other words, they are really, really safe um, investments that you're taking on. Now, the problem was, though, in 2005, interest rates started to grow in America. And that meant that lots of these subprime borrowers found it very difficult to repay their mortgages and they became really, really risky. And lots of people started defaulting on their property. <clears throat> now, the problem now was all these big financial firms that had bought into this mortgage market realised these mortgages they bought were not quite as safe as what they thought they were. Um, house prices started to fall. Lots of people fell into what we call negative equity, where their mortgage is bigger than the house value. And they literally handed the keys back to the banks. So banks lost an absolute fortune across the world. Banks, because of this, stopped lending to each other and lending to households. And this created a liquidity problem, which meant that across the world, um, it became difficult to access borrowing, which in effect had a devastating impact on aggregate demand.
and as global income started to fall and unemployment started to grow, export demand fell, so AD fell even worse. Because people saw their house prices fall, they were in negative wealth, which meant they had to start saving more money, spending less, and this led to a massive drop in global GDP. Now, what made it worse after this period of time was the introduction in the UK of fiscal austerity. So the idea was when the recession started, our government spent billions of pounds through expansionary fiscal policy. But then they realised they had to pay down the debt. And that meant that government spending was cut massively, which in some respects made the problem even worse. You've got here, though, the original response in the UK to um, the credit um, the, the credit crunch or the financial crash. There was lots of bailouts of big banks. So some were allowed to go bust, but that was feared it would create another Great Depression of the 1920s. So what happened was in the UK, our government took ownership of lots and lots of big banks. They bailed them out. And we're looking at banks like Northern Rock and Lloyd's TSB. The idea was by rescuing these banks, it would hopefully put more confidence back into the financial system and prevent a collapse in credit and liquidity across the country. Uh, we also cut interest rates massively. They went down from over 5% down to 0.5% to try and push up borrowing to raise more consumption and investment. Uh, we also used originally expansionary fiscal policy. So we had a big rise in budget deficit. So what happened was um, in the UK, we introduced a cut in VAT to try and stimulate growth. We introduced different schemes, such as, the, such as the car scrappage scheme, which gave people a guaranteed amount of money from the government towards buying a new car if they traded in their old car. Uh, when we had big financial support in the housing market to, to stimulate growth in demand for houses. Uh, now, look at this then. Even though the financial crash was as big a problem as the Great Depression, the idea was that we didn't have as big a drop in GDP in 08 as we did in 1929 because we had more government intervention and support taking place. And it was kind of evidence in many people's eyes that um, Keynes was right that when things aren't going very well, we need expansionary fiscal and monetary policy to take place. Right, guys, just to wrap things up, what I'd like you to think about these questions then, please. What caused recessions? How did policy responses to the financial crisis differ from those of the Wall Street crash? Right, everyone, once you put down your answers, you're now at the end of the video. So thank you very much.